Hi, and welcome to Flute Pro Shop. I'm Joan Sparks, and I have the great pleasure today to be with Daniel Dorf and Cindy Ann Brose. And we have just come from a rehearsal of Daniel's Flute Sonata, Three Lakes, and um, it was an amazing experience to hear this work. And I really feel that um, it's a significant uh, contribution to the flute literature. Thank you. Um, you're very Thank welcome. You. And it's, a, it's a good literature. <laughs> I mean, that what's already there. Is, yeah, what's yeah, already there. Yeah. But I do think this fills a real niche um, because it just is, has so many elements in it that are so fascinating. So I wanted to chat a little bit today about some of those elements in the music that really we found so breathtaking and also about the process of you know being commissioned so you're being commissioned and you're the commissioner Correct. we've given you a um promotion now you're the commissioner oh so that's <laughs> wonderful are you glad about that <laughs> it's wonderful absolutely so why did you choose daniel for this commission well for me i when choosing a composer to commission a work uh, I want to play something that, when I listen to the body of their music, that is listenable to me, mm -hmm. is interesting, has complexity. So I chose some. I chose Daniel because his music uh, really touched that aesthetic in me, mm -hmm. and it also is you know has so much complexity, mm -hmm. and so. And for me, when you're choosing a composer, when you're commissioning your work, you really have to want their music, not just their name, right. not just the composer, but you want to have music that appeals to you. Absolutely. And I have to say, there, this is a hard piece of music. It is. It is not for the faint of heart. No. And that last movement goes lickety-split. It does. And so did you ask Daniel to write you something that was going to be like, Huge? <laughs> no, I didn't. I um, when I asked him, I wanted a sonata, and he had not written a sonata for flute before, flute and piano. And I asked him to, you know, I commissioned a sonata, and pretty much, I know his work, and I know that he doesn't write for the individual, but for the the instrument. Mm -hmm. And knowing that it would most likely be difficult and be to the top of the range and to the bottom of the range, and requiring very pianissimo expressions at the top of the range and fortissimo expressions at the bottom of the range and many notes and that type of thing. You know, I, I had an idea that it was going to be something like that and that he wouldn't hold back mm -hmm. because he was going to be writing, you know, a, a solid work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... Uh, I was pleased when I got it. Of course, it is demanding, and then the ensemble elements are also demanding when you put it with the piano. That's where it gets tricky with the transitions, and you know, and and there's a lot of mixed meter mm -hmm. and and all of that, as you saw and heard. Absolutely. So yes, I knew he'd write a wonderful piece. Well, it's it's what we learned in in music history through composed. So the themes in each of the movements are somewhat related. It seems there, you know, there's a unified kind of DNA exactly. that yeah. that goes through. And if I were to write a number of sonatas in the future, these three movements belong in the same sonata as each other. It's not the same theme, and but there's just a certain approach. This would be true of any 19th century sonata or symphony, mm -hmm. and that's something that drives me and excites me. That the surface is often very pretty, seemingly for prettiness's sake. But not really, because there's a lot more going on. Some people say that my music is French on the outside and German on the inside. Oh, that's fascinating. And yeah, I mean, that, maybe it's a little overstated, but I certainly agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, you couldn't substitute any other nationalities if mm -hmm. you're going to look at it that way, because mm -hmm. the way that Brahms and Beethoven build large works, mm -hmm. to me, that's the structure. My sister is an architect. Oh, really? And so, and we were both at Penn at the same time. So I used really? to read her structures book. Oh my and, goodness. You know, they talk about how music is frozen architecture. Exactly. Or, or the other way around, yeah, yeah. And it really makes a lot of sense that mm -hmm. there are a lot of little arches mm -hmm. and a lot of interrelationships between things. And, you know, I could see this morning when we were rehearsing, as you were getting familiar with the piece, as Matt was at his third rehearsal of a piece that he didn't know until recently, I could see, like, oh, that's. That's like that, that this counterpoint here matches what was over there. Mm -hmm. 
And this is what you do learning 19th century music, too. Mm -hmm. Now, did you do that? Were you recognizing that that, that the counterpoint, or was that on purpose? Or That's, was that well, it's an interesting that question. The immediate counterpoint is a lot of imitation. Yes. Is, um, that certainly is very much on purpose, a recapitulation or whatever. Naturally, you know, I have to know what I'm doing, but often a relationship between themes and different movements, I might not realize, oh, there's four notes going down the scale in this movement and that movement, even though that one's half steps and that one's whole steps, or a long, long short is in every movement, or mm -hmm. little things like that, are, you know, can keep it sort of bound together. Oh, that's great. Without my realizing until later. Yeah, that must be yeah. fascinating. It's fun to hear, thinking, oh, yeah, no wonder that works. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, Cindy, you and I were talking yesterday about how you and I, in our heads, only hear what's already been written. That's right. And how interesting it is to think of a composer who hears original music. Yeah. I mean, I don't hear original music in my head. So when you write a sonata like this, do you, um, I mean, the process is it like writing a novel? I mean, you probably have I don't know. a novel. <laughs> but do you um, start with an idea and then develop it? or? For me, it's a very irregular, unpredictable process. That really? Some pieces like Woodland Reverie, I sat down, I was like Goldilocks. While my soup was cooling off, <laughs> I sat down at the piano and started noodling, noodling around. Oh, that's a joke because of the soup. I was noodling <laughs> around. But, but oh, I, I, wasn't, yeah, I wasn't planning to write a piece for solo flute that day. I just was sort of um, experimenting, and all of a sudden there it was. August Ideal also just popped out in total by itself. The Sonata took about a year. Really? Working on and Perennials also took about a year. But it wasn't an even year. It could be an incredibly intense weekend of things working out. No ideas for another month or two. Hmm. Sometimes um, dribbling slowly, like a few bars a day. And it depends a lot. Sometimes on the nature of the music, slow movements with a big melody sometimes go faster than something with a lot of counterpoint. Mm -hmm. But not necessarily. And you know, on one hand, I wish that I could just snap my fingers and be productive every day. But I think that I'm composing subconsciously without realizing oh, it. And that's yeah. why some of these days, so much comes out, because I, I was sort of, I knew what was going to happen once I had a chance. Do you find, Cindy, that when you come up with a with an interesting problem flute-wise, that right. you know you work on it subconsciously, because three or four days later it'll come? That I, that's that's right. I can really relate to, because, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you put it back there, and then, bam, it comes out. It's it just really... Yeah. So this sonata is programmatic. You're describing three links that were mm -hmm. very special to you in your right. childhood. Yeah. And um, there are certain passages that I can really hear tonal painting. Like mm -hmm. um, in the first movement, those triplets to me sound like the sun bouncing off the water kind of a thing. Okay. <laughs> I can think that if good. I want. Absolutely. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Know, you. I can remember in seventh grade music appreciation class, just general for the whole school, our teacher played a piece of music and told everybody to write down what they thought it was. Uh huh. And he said, if you hand it in, you get an A. And he said, and then we'll discuss, because everybody was right. If you say what you thought it was, then that's what you perceived from it. It was the first movement of La Mer. I said something about clouds, I think. We're going back a few years. But his point was that there is no right or wrong, mm -hmm. and that the fact that you get anything out of it mm -hmm. means that there was a good, positive communication. Mm -hmm. The first movement was actually developed out of a song. That I, that I had written, the, 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 that first lake is a reminiscence of a romantic getaway weekend. So it's a very romantic movement. There's a mm -hmm. lot of ebb and flow. It's written actually in the music, verse and refrain, because it's in the kind of form that is a verse and refrain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny. I got that idea for a piece of serious concert music from the Ives Third Violin Sonata, which it sounds nothing at all like. Except that he had sort of ambling verses and then a similar refrain. It's really a set of double variations, you could say, also, because it always comes back different. And there's a lot of plaintive descending things and half yes. steps that yes. just sort of sigh romantically. Yes. The second movement is about a lake where my parents used to vacation for 20 or 30 years at a resort up in Maine that had a lot of music. 
and my parents' wills was to have their ashes spread there. And my father passed away while I was writing this. Really? Yeah, I had already decided oh to use that lake goodness. as the slow movement, but that sort of exaggerated, you know, my desire to make it a memorial to him. And you can hear ashes sort of mm -hmm. sifting down through the water with all that the very gentle descending half steps. But all those descending notes are like the descending diatonic notes in the first movement. So, you know, like Strauss said and like and Berlioz said, it's going to work as music. Mm -hmm. The program is a really interesting extra layer that can help me get started writing or help listeners get started listening. But it still has to work. The building has to stand up. And the third movement is inspired by a lake where I spent all of my vacations oh. when I was a little boy. And you can hear eight-year-old Danny, like, uh -huh. you know, it's almost Tiller and Spiegel. I was a yeah. troublemaker, but a very happy one. Really? And that's you can hear all the pranks perfect. going on. And yeah, you, you But can. not specifically, but the mood of it. Yes, You know, absolutely. it's not a surprise there was a sort of overzealous little boy uh -huh. <laughs> running right. around there. Yeah. Right, that's great. Mm -hmm. And so... When you learned this, Cindy, yes. did you get it as a finished piece, or did you learn it as it was being written? Well, I, Danny had showed me parts of it, mm -hmm. and said, now how does this work, you know, for flute fingering and that type of thing, and mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, write what you want, you know, we'll, we'll we work it out, but, you know, that, that's our job, um, and so, uh, so I had seen a little bit of it, mm -hmm. Uh, but and I knew what the context was. I knew mm -hmm. what each lake was going to be, mm -hmm. and I uh, so I had some notion of you know that the second movement was going to be slow and somewhat of a memorial, and the that the third mo movement was going to be you know a, a, a quick and fun piece. I didn't realize how capricious it was going to be. Very, it's a romp. <laughs> it is. It reminded me. It reminds me very much of the third movement of the Poulenc Sonata. Yes, I thought that too. Yes, and it's uh, and and it is. It's capricious, and and even when you've rehearsed it, it still sneaks up on you. Mm -hmm. So then I think of you know a child, an mm -hmm. eight year old um, Daniel Dorf, you know sneaking up and and playing little pranks because I think oh goodness you know. Got your fingers and, and as you said, I mean, it's like technically mm -hmm. very challenging, and so, and it's always surprising every time you play it. There's, it's still, even when you know it, it's still a surprise. Yeah. yeah. And the second movement, I had met Daniel's father and and knew him, and so I have, um, and what a lovely man Richard Dorf was, I, I must say, and uh, and I know that they had a very very close and special relationship and. And there's some humor actually in the second movement too, because his father was a very a man with a wonderful sense of humor and quite wry. And so that movement, you know, I feel the differences between the um, a little bit of sense of humor thrown in, and then there's some gravity in it, mm -hmm. and then just some very some great sweetness, right? Just real right. love and sweetness. Mm -hmm. And of course, the first movement is is you know a, a delightful. You know, beautiful thing again. Not not easy. Lots of changing meter. Um, you know, you're not quite sure. In way, it reminds me a little bit of Brahms. Is you think, what key am I in? Am I in it? Well, I see what's in the key signature, but that's mm -hmm. not what key. Now I'm what? Am I beginning? <laughs> am I ending? Mm -hmm. Am I ending and then beginning something new mm -hmm. and and working those passages so that they work phrasing wise? That is that that's certainly a challenge. But uh, so I had that knowledge of. You know, and I also knew how he composed, so mm -hmm. I sort of had some idea how it was going to come out. But again, the third movement still surprises me. I'm sure. <laughs> There's something that Joan's question could also touch on about what happens when a clarinetist writes a lot of flute music. And that you've been very helpful, in a particular, in this case, with the first and second movement, about phrasing, tonguing, and so on. Because clarinet, long legato, mm -hmm. I mean, this is still... All these pieces I've written for flute or flute and clarinet duets, we're still having this discussion about how separated, bum 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 bum, in the slow movement. Mm -hmm. On the clarinet, I would play them more connected because of articulation, and you prefer to add more space than I would think. But I'm always hearing it from two or three feet away, mm -hmm. not from forty feet away mm -hmm. in the hall. And it didn't occur to me until 
really when we worked on that Puccini book, mm -hmm. that it's not the same for the two instruments. I grew up as a saxophonist, oh. and I started composing because I wanted there to be more classical saxophone recital music. I had been working on music by Ebert and Bozzo and Francais and so on. So some people say, how come a lot of your music sounds French or has a French attitude towards woodwind playing? In a way, that's my mother tongue. Uh, you know, I've heard yes. everything else since then and learned uh -huh. from everybody else, but I gravitate towards the approach that those French mid-century composers had mm -hmm. to have a lot of passage work, a lot of beautiful melody, a certain amount of neoclassical. You know, it's fresh, not sounding like 19th century, but it's also traditional. Mm -hmm. And it comes, I think, out of all that sensibility. But I started there as a saxophonist who switched over to clarinet just to have chances to play in orchestra and band and so on. And even though I played a little bit of flute just as a doubler, mm -hmm. it's never been my instrument. Mm -hmm. But so many of my friends are flutists. And getting back to something you said before, word of mouth and how people choose who to commission, mm -hmm. I get a lot of flute commissions, I think mostly because I already have some. Right. And people say, oh, I heard this piece by him. I want one for me mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I write a lot of flute music, and I almost get it. <laughs> that, that it's so idiomatic in a way for an instrument where you breathe, mm -hmm. or where you want to alternate passage work with breathing, where you know that you need a little bit of space here and there. But I still, I mean, in this piece, there's so many A major and E major scales where with offset fingering that is hard in the upper register. Yeah. I didn't write that to be hard, and I didn't really even know it was hard. Just like the high A to B trill and shivering that kills everybody. <laughs> you know, when I play it on a piano, it's just the, the, the MIDI sounded fine. But, Are you comparing us to a MIDI? No, no I'm, I'm comparing myself to a, a very common mistake among composers, mm. is that mm -hmm. if you don't play the instrument, there are pitfalls that you really have to learn about. Mm -hmm. And on piccolo, that A to B trill, Mm -hmm. You know, as a wind player, knowing saxophone and clarinet fingerings, I would think that whole step trills between F sharp and G sharp, or G sharp and A sharp, those might be hard. Because mm -hmm. on my instrument, mm -hmm. they're hard. A to B is just this. Because mm -hmm. we don't have different fingerings all yeah, the way up there. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, sometimes I learn. But I've been so spoiled by wonderful players. This one is a great example. <laughs> that at the first rehearsal, you know, are you sure you wanted this? And, and my answer has become, probably. You know, <laughs> you'll, I, That's diplomatic. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I always am glad to change things that don't work. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, well, you may have anecdotes about other pieces of mine where this happened, but like the A-sharps and August Ideal, right. that, I mean, that's what people talk about. To me, that looks so simple. The A-sharps or the B-flats, because I don't play instruments that have four ways to finger that. Right, three. Right. Three ways to do that, yeah. If you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the, the part about the phrasing and the re repeating notes, mm -hmm. I mean, you're still teaching me that. And I'm so curious to hear, as this piece gets played by more people, mm -hmm. and I was thinking that this morning about tempos, because I love the fact that you and Matt were adding ebb and flow that wasn't really in the score per se, other than my instructions to be as percivo. And you're knowing that I wanted it to be. Right. Well, I don't say where written to... Written into it. You know, don't you think it's written into it? It's, yes. It's, it's written into it. You're inviting it. You know, if you play my music, if you play Barber, if you play Howard Hansen, maybe... You know, these are composers whose sensibility is add your swells, mm -hmm. add your rhythmic ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. But in the 20th century, so many composers, their idiom was not like that. Mm -hmm. And that they were explicit about little things and that they didn't want that much expressivity. And so a lot of performers have learned not to do that. Right, right. And then now I think we're at the stage where you really have to know which kind of composer or which kind of attitude goes right with this piece. Because there are still many pieces being written now where you don't really add expressivity, that everything is in there and it is mechanical. The composer's kind of like a micromanager. Mm -hmm. as right. Far as and really, you know, for my sonata, the first two movements do need a lot of expressive mm -hmm. input. The third movement's pretty mechanical, don't, don't you think that that will not vary so much by player? Yes. You can't, yeah. you cannot, in that movement, I have to resist the temptation to be too musical. 
<laughs> and I, I say I that in the nicest that. way yeah. because yeah. it's it's written in, of course. Of course. But if you get to the musical and you start to bend triplets, especially when you're going against a piano that has quintuplets or you've got all this hemiola and this, this, this interesting rhythms that are there, if you, for instance, go ba da da di da 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 di right there, you're, you're off with the piano because they are very, you know, the pianist is very, is very structured and they're doing quintuplets or something along those lines. And so there's certain places where you're, expecting a, a strong downbeat and a cue and then there's other places where you just have to play it almost metronomically and the phrasing you know is strictly through the air you cannot bend you cannot uh, exercise rubato and but it will be heard just because of the nature of mm -hmm. of the composition where the notes fall and the and the direction and all of that so we're talking at the end of january um, 2014, and we have some exciting performances coming up for the Sonata. We have um, a April number, the 5th yeah. at um, St. Joseph's University mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. Yes. And then some other ones are coming up. On February 22nd, I have a wonderful two performances that are not wonderful that they're at the same time. Uh oh. Because I want to hear both of them. Yeah. And actually, there's a lineage because Amy Porter, who studied with you, uh, she never studied with me, no. She did not study with. We, okay. She grew up in the same oh, hotel. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, but no, she was. Oh, I thought she history. was a protege. All right, no. so while well, Amy's performing it at the Mid Atlantic Flute Fair mm -hmm. on Saturday, the 22nd of February, and Nicole Esposito, who studied with Amy mm -hmm. at Ann Arbor, she's playing it also the same day, the 22nd, at the Atlanta Flute Club's oh, Flute okay. Fair. And Nicole is also playing Sonatine de Journey. Oh, great. So, you know, to hear both of those back to back, it will be interesting also because. The slow movements of both of those, in a way, are sort of similar. The way that they're sort of arches that peak, the dynamic peaks here, or the harmony peaks here, or the tempo peaks here, but they're still all arches. Mm -hmm. And so both of those movements are similar. Fabulous. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us Thank today. You. And this is Joan Sparks from Flute Pro Shop welcoming, welcoming you back with Daniel Dorf and Cindy Ann Brooks. <laughs>